Amen. You may be seated. I'm so thankful for our musicians, all of them who voluntarily serve week by week. And one thing that I'm so grateful for is that the musicians in our church, some of us who are older and some who are younger, uh, are, are willing to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, old songs and new songs, and recognize the value of them all. I'm a believer in blended worship, some old things and some new things. and. Uh, and I'm just so thankful we can do that with a great spirit. In fact, you know, the, the song Breathe is just a, you know, a few years old, and then Make Me a Servant is about maybe like 20 years old, 30. And uh, then some of the sing, hymns we're singing are about 100 years old. Uh, I almost picked Shepherd of Tender Youth for our opening hymn today. And uh, do you know when that hymn was composed? About 320 A.D. So, uh, you know, we can sing songs that are literally almost 2,000 years old. Uh, not many have lasted that long, but a few have. And praise the Lord. And we can praise the Lord, too, in a way that is a blessing to ears of all ages. So I'm, I'm so appreciative of that. We have not had any struggles over worship music in our church, and I'm so thankful for that, everybody giving preference to one another. Well, we're going to look today at the Good Samaritan. I kind of got things backwards today, this week. Uh, last week I preached on Mary and Martha, and that's the end of Luke 10. And this week we're going backwards a little bit to the Good Samaritan. And that's just simply because when I was looking at the list of scriptures, gospel lessons, uh, somehow my trifocals and bifocals didn't focus right. And I got the, this week's last week and last week's this week. And, uh, but you know, the Holy Spirit is sometimes in those things too. And I felt that the message last week was received um, in a way was intended to be received last week. And hopefully that's the, true of this Good Samaritan lesson as well. We're focusing on Christ, uh, uh, the Life of Christ series this year, focusing on gospel readings. And we're looking at Luke 10, 25 through 37 today. Now, I don't know what you do for reading, personal reading, personal study, uh, books you listen to as you drive in your car, but I kind of spurt around to different topics. Uh, you know, it could be hobby topics or personal interests and different things catch my attention, and I read or listen to talks and stuff on those topics. And um, right now I'm having a little bit of a time uh, in a topic that I've never studied in my whole life, and that is Stoic philosophy. You ever heard people say, oh, he's so Stoic? And that's usually an insult kind of meaning, you know, kind of old-fashioned or reserved. But um, we really have that wrong. Uh, stoic philosophy is making a great comeback uh, in the world today. And, and rightly so. Uh, it's from long before the time of Christ, a, a bit before the time of Christ, but it was a popular, uh, not popular, but it was an important philosophy in Greece and Rome. Um, it was the philosophy of really the last good Roman ruler before all those nasty Caesars came in, Marcus Aurelius. And uh, other people, you've heard of names like Seneca and things like that in your studies. And um, uh, Marcus Aurelius lived by four Stoic principles. And think about this. I mean, this is what we need today because Stoicism was a reaction to a corrupt government and a debased society. And boy, that's what we need now. An immoral society, unjust, uh, corrupt and a corrupt government. Stoicism was a reaction to that. And Marcus Aurelius, a good leader who had, was kicked out of office with coups twice and, and went through so much trouble, lived by these four principles. Uh, courage, moderation, justice, and wisdom. Courage, moderation, justice, and wisdom. <laughs> what does that sound like? Sounds like the book of Proverbs, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, it's really uh, tied in with some good biblical principles. Did you know 
that many famous military generals in, in our nation's history during World War II, World War I, other times of great conflict when they had to make important decisions would carry with them the writings of Marcus Aurelius and Stoicism as just a guideline for their thinking, for clear thinking in a time of trial and trouble. Um, so anyway, I'm reading about Stoicism lately, and it kind of gets us into the teaching of Jesus because the teaching of Jesus, much of it like the Sermon on the Mount and other things, also bear with these important, basic, fundamental principles to guide our life and also in a deeper sense to bring us to the cross as well. But one thing that impresses me, um, you know, the parable of the Good Samaritan, oftentimes we take it out of context because that was simply a response to a teacher of the law who came to him with a question. And I think it's really important well, to put this in the context it is because it is a really tremendous, even salvation-oriented uh, story of all things. But Jesus always was dealing with people according to their need at the moment. Think of the different ones we've talked about in the past weeks. Uh, the rich young ruler. What did he tell him? Sell everything and follow me. And then all of a sudden, a few weeks ago, we look at the Gadarean demoniac. He said, I want to follow you. I want to leave everything and follow you. And him, he gave the opposite advice. No, go back home and stay there. And don't follow me, but minister to those back home. Um, and then Zacchaeus, the social outcast that nobody wanted to associate with. What did Jesus do? Went to his house for a meal. Unfortunately. Unthinkable, unthinkable, but he did it, and it changed his life. And then what about Mary Magdalene? What was her need? She was a prostitute filled with demons, and Jesus gave her time and helped her get set free from the demons and changed her life. And then Martha, the workaholic, we saw that last week. He uh, addressed her workaholism. And what about her sister Mary, the one who loved to sit at Jesus' feet and hear his teaching? He blessed that. Each person was dealt with according to their need. Isn't that the secret of good counseling? Everybody being dealt with where they're at. I, I often say two kids can be playing ball and hit a baseball through the neighbor's uh, 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 picture window and the two little boys come into the house and they each have a different need. One is defiant and says, I don't care, I don't like my neighbor. Anyway, I'm glad I did it. What's his need? Spanking, right? And one is broken hearted and upset and so sad and oh, I feel so terrible. What do they need, a spanking? No, they need a hug. Secret of good counseling, I remember Dr. Munseth, I believe, saying this in seminary so many years ago, is knowing when to give the law and when to give the gospel. That's the secret. And two people need the law or the gospel even for the same situation. Well, here we have an interesting person, uh, a highly respected teacher of the law, and Jesus addresses him with this amazing story of the Good Samaritan. But we need to look at the context first. And the first thing we want to look at here, the first slide up here, is the demand of the law. The demand of the law. We don't think about this part when you think of the Good Samaritan, but this is an important part of the interaction. Luke 10, 25 through 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Jesus gave an answer I would not have given. The demand of the law. Here we have an expert in the law. Today we might call this a seminary professor or a theologian. And this scholar wanted for, to know from Jesus a question that a lot of people want to know. What must I do 
to attain eternal life, to inherit eternal life. It's the question on many people's mind. And uh, thinking of Romans 3.20, therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. And what does Jesus tell him to do? Observe the law. <laughs> Romans 3.20 says you can't get saved by observing the law. He wisely started right at the expertise of this person who was an expert in the law. He said to him right away, he said, what does the law of Moses say? Well, he said, in summary, love, love God perfectly and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Uh, that's what. And, and, and this is right where I would say, but of course you can't do that to be saved. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, you're right. Go do it. You're right. Go do it. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, one of the reasons that we don't see the need for the grace of God is that we make a law that is attainable. Jesus set up the standard right here. Moses set up the standard. God set up the standard. Perfection. Perfect love for God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love for your neighbor. Think of Matthew 5 where Jesus said, I even tell you to love your enemies. And then verse 48 of Matthew 5, therefore, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus didn't give him anything achievable. He gave him the full force of the law of God. And, uh, you know, we like to make things achievable, don't we? We like to make uh, the, the, the word of God achievable. And uh, he set up the perfect standard. God can't tolerate sin. God can't tolerate evil. He wants us to love God perfectly and love our neighbor perfectly as yourself and even love our enemies because that's what the holiness of God demands. He's holy. He's perfect. Um, but I think about how long could I go if I was told this is what I must do to gain eternal life. Could I make it a day loving God perfectly and loving my neighbor perfectly as myself? I don't think I could make it five minutes. I don't. I don't know if I ever make it beyond breakfast without being selfish. <laughs> you know, I, I, I really can't think of time that I have. Uh, trying to be imperfect is important, though. It's very important. The only re time that we'll admit that we're not perfect is if we first try to be perfect. We have to try to be perfect. That's very important. Uh, we need Otherwise, we'll try to be favorable to God through self-effort, and we've got to try for perfection. That's God's standard. Can you imagine if that wasn't God's standard? Say, why is God so, why is God so, have such a high standard? Can you imagine if God let sin into heaven? What would eternal heaven be like if there was lying there? What would eternal heaven be like if there was envy there? What was eternal heaven be like if there was Murder there. What, if he, what would eternal heaven be like if people didn't care for each other as they care for themselves? It wouldn't be heaven. It would be terrible. It would be like life in this earth forever and ever. Be thankful that God's standard for heaven is perfection and that he does not allow one sin into heaven. Be thankful. This is the demand of the law. Secondly, the dilemma of the heart. The dilemma of their heart, Luke 10, 29. But he wanted to justify himself. Oh, that's what happens next. He wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, uh, who is my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? At this point, this expert in the law is starting to squirm. He's starting to squirm. Uh, he couldn't argue with Jesus because Jesus agreed with him. <laughs> How do you like that? Jesus agreed with them. Yes, that's God's standard. Go and you shall live. 
But, but, but then he started to get nervous. He probably didn't mind the idea of loving God with all his heart, but I think he started to think about some people he had no interest in loving as himself. So he thought, well, we'll get this clarified. Who is my neighbor? And I'm sure as an expert in the law, he expected something like a Sabbath day journey a a a answer, saying, well, everybody who lives within three blocks of you or everybody who's related to you or, or whatever. That's the kind of answer he wanted. But the Holy Spirit was starting to wake him up. The Holy Spirit was starting to wake him up. But many of us like to justify ourselves. Uh, we like to justify ourselves, how we eat, how we spend our time. We, we want to please God, but we do want to do it on our own terms. And, and there's a lot of effort today to cut parts out of the Bible. People are cutting parts out of the Bible because they want to be following, you know, a higher path, but a path of their own choosing. A path of their own choosing. They said Thomas Jefferson would cut parts out of his Bible that he didn't like and didn't agree with. And by the time he was an old man, there was almost nothing left. And uh, there's many issues today that are dividing people because we don't like God's standard. God's standard for marriage, one man, one woman. Uh, God's standard for this whole issue of abortion, thou shalt not kill. That's God's standard. That's God's standard. Think of the Hippocratic Oath, Hippocratic Oath that uh, doctors used to take. I will do no harm. They can't do that anymore. I will do no harm. Uh, this is dividing people today. People don't want to live up to God's standard. They say the Bible is out of date. I have a better way. People actually brag about sin today. And uh, it seems like our whole culture uh, is trying to justify sin. And what's the end result? What's the end result? Our society is falling into chaos. You see the violence all over. Do you see Starbucks? pulled out of many cities now, many stores, because it is too dangerous anymore. And of course, the CEO of Starbucks has been a major player in bringing the standards of our culture down. And then the cities where they are strong are falling into chaos and ruin because they're living out his philosophy and he can't have stores there um, anymore. Chaos and ruin is coming. And my question for us all today is this, even if it means our jobs, even if it costs us our job, will we stick with the Ten Commandments? Will we stick with the standard that God has put for us? And then thirdly, let's look at the law-oriented life. So Jesus tells this parable. In the beginning of this parable is a description of a law-oriented life. Life, and he's really addressing this man he's talking to. Verses 30 to 37 of Luke 10. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of the robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. You know, our cities are getting so violent now. Uh, this is not unusual, actually, to find a scenario like this anymore. A priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite. When he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. Uh, the first thing Jesus pointed out is that a priest and a Levite passed by this man who was robbed and beaten. Remember, these priests and these Levites were experts in the law, just like the man Jesus was talking to. This was his buddies. This was his comrades, his uh, people that he was talking about. They were undoubtedly in a rush to do what? To serve God. They were in a rush to serve God. You know, this is kind of a Mary and Martha thing here. They didn't want anything to get in the way of their agenda to do their higher and more nobler work of teaching the word of God, the law of God. And uh, just like Martha didn't want to get, let uh, listening to Jesus get in the way of serving Jesus. 
Uh, how many times? Oh, let's quit picking on them for a while and let's think about ourselves. How many times do we get so consumed by our good agenda that we don't have time for an interruption from a child or someone in need? How many times do we get so caught up in our good agenda that we don't get, have time for an interruption from a child or someone in need? I remember here reading about a very famous Christian speaker who spoke to thousands of people. I don't know if he's still living anymore. Uh, all over the world back, you know, 20, 30 years ago, and a very famous author, and he disappeared for a year canceled all of his speaking assignments all over the world. And finally, a year later, someone who knew him caught up with him and said to him, what's going on in your life? Why have you canceled all your speaking engagements? Why haven't you written any magazine articles? Why haven't you put out a new book? What's going on? And he said, I needed to take a year off to help my brother die. He gave up great honorariums. He gave up great chances. He was a great Christian teacher to speak all over the world for God. He gave up a whole year to help his brother die. quite opposite of these teachers of the law. I have to admit that sometimes I get so caught up in my to-do list that I miss out on opportunities to help people around me who are in need. I probably don't even see them. I get so tunnel visioned and focused in what I'm doing. Uh, sometimes it's just as simple as taking time to listen to somebody. And for some of us, that's a big job. Taking time, a sacrifice, to just listen to somebody. Sometimes that's all it is. Uh, letting them unburden their soul to you. That's why I really enjoy our uh, Saturday night prayer meetings. Because the agenda I have for the prayer meetings... Uh, I used to come with a devotional prepared, and I had a devotional, then we had prayer requests and a prayer time, and uh, I've changed that now, and our Saturday night pre prayer meeting, I purposely come with absolutely no agenda, we light a fire, we sit. If someone has a thought from the Word of God they want to share, they can do that. If they have a prayer need, we stop and pray for them, and it is such a a blessed thing because we offer just uninterrupted time. And we're like Quakers waiting for the Lord to lead. And, and it is a, a real blessing not to be in a driven, a driven state. It's kind of nice instead of thinking about what I'm going to say to the people on my way over here, I'm just praying that the Lord would move in our hearts. And we've had some interesting prayer meetings this year. People just showing up who are just sitting there waiting to meet someone else and they stay. And the first time in their life probably that they get to hear the gospel, we share and pray for them and witness to them. You know, it's, 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 you know sometimes when you don't have an agenda and just are prayerful and open, God's got a better agenda than we could have anyway. Uh, so that's the legalistic life, the law-oriented life. Move on, get it done, don't change the plan no matter what, because I'm serving God, right? Then the spirit-filled life, the spirit-filled life, verses 33 to 37. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine, then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. 
Which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy. Jesus wanted to show this expert in the law that what loving God and loving your neighbor really looks like. To the expert in the law, loving God meant strict Sabbath keeping, strict dietary law keeping, strict separation with people who are not full-blooded Jews, and on and on, and so forth. But Jesus shows him what loving God and others really looks like. The example of the spirit-filled life, the grace-oriented life, rather than the legalistic approach. Notice that the example is a Samaritan. He said a Samaritan did this. Now, what is a Samaritan? A person of mixed blood, part Jew, part Gentile, a person of mixed religion, part Old Testament Moses, part a lot of ideas passed down from his pagan forefathers, all mixed up. They didn't use the temple in Jerusalem. Um, you know, if you're a Protestant, you might say Jesus would have said, well, a Catholic came along. And if you're a Catholic, you might say, well, a Protestant came along. Or if you're a Protestant or a Catholic, Jesus might have said, well, a Mormon came along. Or a Jehovah's Witness came along. Oh, dare I say, even a Buddhist or a Muslim came along as he traveled to where this man was. This Samaritan is someone who didn't make the grade in ethnic background, didn't make the grade in religious background, did not make the grade in Bible knowledge or practice. Secondly, notice that this Samaritan had pity on this beaten and robbed man. He got involved emotionally. He cared about those who were less fortunate. His agenda for that day was not merely to accomplish the important business meeting he was going to, but to be a blessing along life's way. You know, having right beliefs is very important. Doing right activities is very important. But if we miss out on having compassion in our hearts for others, uh, being right is very cold and very hard. And there's a lot of people, the other young people who have left the church and left their parents' faith because their parents were right, but it was a hard, cold kind of right. And then thirdly, uh, notice that he used his money. He used his money. Uh, there's an old saying about this. He put his money where his mouth is. He did not just talk about being nice and kind and helpful to others, but he actually made a difference. He actually made a difference in the life of a suffering man, and it cost him something. I think of one pastor in Lakeville who is a very expert in the area of, of uh, properties and property development and, uh, and uh, real estate, he actually has a real estate license, and one of the things he does and his church works on is helping provide housing for low-income people. And they build housing for elderly, they build housing in certain places. And he said, uh, I got a call the other day from a man in California who's very wealthy, and he wants to use some of his wealth in a way that's good, and he heard about me and what I'm doing, and they saw the... Uh, riots in Minneapolis and all the stuff being uh, burned down. And he was wondering if he could invest a few million dollars in housing uh, for people in, in uh, the poorer regions of South Minneapolis. I mean, there are people who God has raised up with finances who have a burden for using them uh, to make a difference in the lives of suffering people. And, you know, it's kind of a neat thing. And then the third thing we see here is commitment. Notice that he promised to come back and follow through on this man. And I think this is very important. You know, we start helping someone and need helping someone who's down. It's a long-term commitment. And a lot of times people who are down and out, they, they shun us away. Why? Because they've experienced so many well-meaning people in their lives who start to help them, but they run out of steam and they leave them, and then there's just another rejection. Just another rejection. And this person had long-term commitment. I think of Pastor Richard Anderson, who used to preach in this pulpit, uh, his long-term commitment uh, to, to souls that he's had in his care. He, he had to go home and take care of his wife, and 
he would keep calling people in our little country church up in Wisconsin on the phone. Many, 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 many phone calls. He said, I can't be there. I can't preach. I can't conduct services. But can I pray with you? You know, he calls Wayne Hansen, who is uh, in hospice, you know. He calls him every day. He's not paid to do it. Every single day, he calls Wayne Hansen in Arizona and prays with him and asks him how he's doing. Every day. Long-term commitment. Wow. To working with and loving people. That's what this Samaritan was like. And then he asks this important question. Which of the three do you th think was a neighbor to this man in need? Um, you know, Jesus never criticized the Pharisees and Sadducees and the people, teachers of the law for their orthodox theology. He never criticized them for their high standards. But what he criticized them for and pointed them out was they did it without love. They had the right beliefs and they did the right things, but they did it without compassion and without mercy and without love. And, and this is so convicting. How are we doing today? Are we like that expert in the law, trying to be pleasing to God in our own frustrated, angry, I'm going to do it, I'm going to be right, and I'm going to follow the rules? Or are we filled with the love of Jesus, the Calvary love, the love that went to the cross for our sins? And uh, this expert in the law found out that he couldn't do it. He couldn't love God and his neighbor as himself as he thought he could. And so, <laughs> there's only one alternative. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. And he will give the Holy Spirit. He'll change your life. He'll warm it up. Forgive your sins. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all human comprehension guard our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. For more information or to contact us, please visit us on the web at mnvalleychurch.org or find us on Facebook at Minnesota Valley Church.